there's a passage that <clears throat> I would um, wasn't going to deal with in this particular study, but then got to thinking more about it and thought, well, this is a, I think it is a huge passage of scripture and one that is kind of misunderstood. So we're going to wade into this one in verse 6. And it's the only verse we're going to be looking at this evening. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. And here it is. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Years ago when Cindy and I were in Greenville, South Carolina, when I was a student at Bible College there, we were newlyweds, been married a couple years, and um, as most of the college students, you, you um, worked, tried to pay bills and study and all of that. And so there were a few of us who worked at Kmart. Kmart is a, it is a not so sufficient, sophisticated version of Walmart, okay? <laughs> That's not saying a lot. Um, but especially during Christmas time, I got to observe a lot of impatient customers, um, angry people. Of course, shoplifters were there, and we dealt with those, and and uh, have a lot of memories, especially at Christmas time at Kmart. I was a supervisor of the checkouts, uh, uh, which meant that I was usually I and another person were supervising 15 registers all going at the same time. And uh, so <clears throat> what really left a, a big impression on me were the kids who screamed for toys or candy in the checkout aisles. And of course, they always position those things within reach of a child, you know, they're just sitting in there, they grab them on both sides, and they have toys and candy and all that stuff. And um, I remember observing that and saying to a lady supervisor that I worked with, I remember saying to, the, to her, my kids are not going to do that. And she said, oh, she kind of laughed. She goes, oh, sure, you say that now, but you'll find out. I said, my kids are not going to do that. And they didn't. Well, they might have done it once. But uh, <laughs> after, after once, if it, if it happened at all, and usually by the time it happened to one of them, if the other ones were observing, they kind of got, they connected the dot and said, hmm, that's not a good thing to do. Early on, we decided, in, out as, in this, a lessons learned there in the aisles of Kmart, you know, when you, I saw kids disrespecting usually their moms because dad would never be so foolish to try to do that. Um, disrespecting their moms. And I made up the decision, made the decision at that point, both of us did, we, we're, we are not going to tolerate disrespect. I'm not going to do it. Um, I'm not going to start, tolerate uh, um, disrespect for their mother or me. It, was, it wasn't going to happen. And it didn't. Um, we trained them not to do that. At least we trained them that they couldn't do it without consequences. <laughs> this passage of Scripture here in chapter 22 of Proverbs in verse 6, when it says, train up a child, it, it makes the assumption of training. The assumption is made of training. And we're going to talk a little bit about that word training, what that means. Uh, our our idea of training is assumed to be uh, pedagogical. It, it, it's like speaking, talking, and so on. Uh, we would think, okay, this means Bible memory, you train them, you know, and um, uh, re rehearsing the things of God, leading by example, and so on. When I was, we were young, and our first child had come, and she was probably two, and she was in the midst of the terrible twos, as they call them, and, and uh, maybe 18 months or so, but she was spreading her wings a little bit and deciding, 
making the decision about whether or not she had to obey us. And, um, and you, know, you know how it is. You can see the little wheels turning in their heads about when they're, when they're rolling over in their minds about whether or not they're going to obey. Well, we lived at that time on the corner of two very busy streets. And um, not only did we re- want her to obey us when we told her, but her life may depend on, you know, Noel come here. And it wasn't going to be any of this running the other way because her life depended on it. It was very, kind of a dangerous place to, to live in the city at that time at, at where uh, we were living. And so uh, Cindy and I, one time, we got on opposite sides of the room. And at first it was a game. I, she would hold Noel, come, and I said, Noel, come here. And so Cindy would give her a little nudge, and Noel would come right over, and then I'd turn her around. And Cindy said, Noel, come here. And, you know, send her back the other way. And at first it was a game. About the third time, third or fourth time, this game was getting old. And uh, so got over to Cindy again. I said, Noel, come here. And Noel didn't. And so uh, Cindy gave her a swat. Not a hard swat. Enough to give her attention. Gave her a swat. Noel didn't like that, but she went across the room to me and I turned around. Cindy called her over. And uh, Noel, come here. But then she just refused. Yeah, you would think one time, but I don't have brilliant kids, okay? So, I mean, it took them at least twice or three times. And we, that was training. You come when you're called. And uh, we did that be- not only because of the principle of obedience, but because her life may depend on her coming exactly at the time that we call. That's kind of our idea of training. But that's not the word used in the original here. In fact, this word is used several times in the Old Testament, and this is the only time that it's translated train. Okay? Um, for instance, uh, in other places in Scripture, the word is translated dedication or dedicated. Uh, if you want to just turn uh, to Deuteronomy chapter 20, and I'll give you an example. I don't want to beat this to death, but uh, Deuteronomy 20. And verse 5, uh, this is a portion of scripture, I believe, that has to do with exemption from, the mili- from military service. And um, I believe that's, it. that's right. Yeah, and the officer, verse 5, and the officer shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not, what's the word, dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicate it. So what he was given was an exemption from military service if he had built a house but never had dwelled in it, never had lived in it, never had established his legacy and identification with that house. Uh, Hence, um, the idea with that is is that it's one of dedication to a path. Uh, in other words, uh, residing and dwelling and establishing, living in and settling in uh, a house. So um, then there's the element in Scripture of this word of commitment as well. Um, in Nehemiah chapter 12 and verse 27, it says, at the, And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of their places to bring them to Jerusalem, to keep the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and with singing, with cymbals and psalters, and with harps. But the idea there, this word dedication, is the same word in Proverbs 22. And the idea is one of commitment. So um, there there are kind of different um, nuances, I guess, is the the word uh, that I'm looking for. In 1 Kings chapter 8, and verse 63, it said, And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered unto the Lord, two and twenty thousand oxen and a hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. So it, that was the inauguration of a purpose. The idea of commitment, the idea of dedication or establishment, Here in chapter 22 and verse 6, this same word is translated 
training. So it's more than just teaching, okay? The idea is one of commitment and dedication and purpose and an and, and established purpose, if you will. It's placing a child in a very special position of attention. Every now and again, we have, uh, we've had baby dedications. Well, baby dedications, that little baby doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> we call it baby dedication. It's not so much baby dedication. It's parent dedication to that baby. And so uh, those parents are saying, I'm going to put this, this individual in a special position so that they might be in the way they should go. And presumably in a home that is godly, Christ-honoring with spiritual parents. So that, that's the assumption of training. Not simply teaching them stuff. Not just having, memorized, having them memorize Bible verses or communicating moral truths or whatever. But it's, it's making them the object of special attention and, and consecration to the Lord. There's the assumption of it. And that that is going to start early. There's, that's the other assumption. Train up a child. Train up a child. Um, there have been many, many times when I have observed a pattern, not simply bad behavior, okay? Every kid acts out. Every kid does. But if it's a pattern of bad behavior, um, I, I start looking at that and I'm thinking, okay, the clock is ticking. Tick tock. You, there is a limited amount of time to deal with this. That's why it says train up a child. Uh, the idea is is that there needs to be. You need to start when they are young and changeable. Um, in, in in many Christian homes, that's just it started way way too late. It. it by the time that child gets to be four or five and the parent hadn't started really curbing that behavior, that is, they are behind, uh, behind the process. The whole idea of changing that young person begins early. Now, everybody communicates training. Every parent communicates some kind of training. But sometimes that training is bad. Um, everybody, every parent communicates values, whether they actually teach them or not. There's always training going on. It, it just depends on whether it's materialistic training or spiritual training. There are parents that really believe that sports is the, the end all of life, and so sports are constantly being talked about. They're communicating a value. There are people that are very patriotic, and they communicate patriotic values. They may communicate moral values. But they're not being taught about relationship with the Lord. And that's what Christian parents are supposed to be doing early. Presupposes a purpose established early, and it presupposes a paradigm imparted by the parents. This kid doesn't know. They don't know where, or the way to go. Who does? The parents do, and the elders do. Um, and in a Christian home, you can't dedicate a child's way unless your way is dedicated. So, and you think about it, that only makes sense. Even just by, it's not simply a matter of knowing, it's a matter of being. I mean, can you imagine if I, as your pastor, said, you ought to live for the Lord, but then I live, I live like the devil. You know, I mean, what kind of message would that send? Or if I said, you ought to witness to folks, but I myself never did. Or if I said, you ought to read your Bible, but I only picked it up to prepare messages from. And, or if I said, you ought to pray, but I never lift my heart heaven, heavenward. Well, you see, it's not just what you teach. It's what you live. It's what you've embraced. And many parents have the idea in raising their children, well, I don't have to be in order to teach my children to be. But if that's your thinking, you are grievously, grievously in error. The idea of training is put in a very special place. And you cannot put them in a special place without a stable, secure place from which to teach. So there's the, 
the assumption that this is going to start early. But notice as well what this passage does point out, the assumption of deferred consequences. Train up a, way, a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, there are, <clears throat> there are guaranteed consequences. And we're not going to talk right now of what kind of consequences, but there's always consequences. When a pattern is established in youth, there are going to be consequences later in life. When thinking develops in a certain direction, <laughs> life is, is the product of choices. And we can choose our choices, but we can't choose our consequences, right? But a lot of times those patterns are established very early on. And that's why he says, train up a child, lest when they're older, they reap consequences. You see, this applies both ways. When it says, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It applies to righteous training. It also applies to wickedness. They won't depart, at least not easily, and not outside the grace of God. Early experience affects future adherence. There are guaranteed consequences later in life, and 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 even a sense of permanency. It's very hard, and mo most of us as adults, you know it's very hard to break a habit once it gets, once you get into that habit, isn't it? Good habits or bad habits, it, you know, it, it, it's hard to break those. There's a permanency in the adherence. Now with all of this pointed out from this passage thus far, let me pause here for a while because this is the area of controversy that's associated, what I'm going to talk to you about now is the area of controversy associated with this passage of Scripture. And I, I, I call it the perception of what we assume. We're talking about the assumptions, and, or the infer maybe I should have called them inferences rather than assumptions, but inferences from the passage. Those things that I've given you up to now, they're just true about the passage. But what is our perception of these assumptions? Well, there are four interpretations of this passage, this passage rather. Now, I want you to understand them. First of all, many people understand this passage to mean that if you train a child correctly, righteous, a righteous, godly life is guaranteed. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. In other words... You train them right, they're going to turn out right, no matter what. That's the interpretation of that passage. Train him in a godly way, and when he, when he gets old, he won't, he won't be anything but godly. And the viewpoint being expressed that if you do your job as a parent, you, your kid will be guaranteed to live for the Lord. Did you ever hear, you ever hear this passage of Scripture taught that way? Yeah. I mean, this has been, it is what I call the formulaic approach to child rearing. All you got to do is just follow the steps. You know, step one, do this. You know, I mean, there are teachers out there. One guy by the name of Michael Pearl, and you may recognize that name. He bills himself as kind of a bib overall, good old farmer boy. You know, but he's he's all he's written books. He and his wife have written books about child rearing, and basically he he prescribes a very formulaic, you follow this formula, you're going to turn out godly kids. So, uh, and people like formulas, right? I mean, we want to be able to have guarantees, and so um, people swallow that. Sometimes there's a modified view of this, and that is if you raise them right, even if they stray, they will return to the right path. You ever hear that one? Okay. So, yeah, they may drift off, but if you've raised them right, they'll come back. But that's not what the passage says. You know, at some point before they die, they're going to come back. That's not what the passage says. So parents of errant children cling to this verse as eventually coming to pass even maybe after they've died. Well, yeah, I'm, 
I know I raised them right, and maybe it's going to be after I'm, I've kicked the bucket, but they're going to come back because God promised me they will. Well, <clears throat> a, primary, a primary objection to this for many people is the, there are, have been some outstanding parents who have loved the Lord and tried to train their children right, and their kids have drifted. I mean, probably among the, even this small crowd that we have here this evening, there would people be able to say, oh yeah, I can think of this person, that, that person, and maybe even a child in your own family, okay? Um, these were families that had family devotions every day. They sent their kids to a, maybe a Bible-believing Christian school. They went to church every service, never missed. They were soul winners, but their kid went bad. And there's only one conclusion that you can reach if you believe that Proverbs 22, 6 means that if you do the right thing, your kids are going to turn out right, but if your kid didn't turn out right, whose fault is it? If you, if you take that passage and say that this is, this is an absolute, then you're the one at fault. There isn't any, I mean, no matter what they choose to do, I mean, obviously they chose to do wrong, but hey, if I'd have trained them right. And sometimes on the heels of that, some Christian parents will say, well, maybe I went too extreme. And I drove them away from, from faith. If maybe if I hadn't been so strict, they wouldn't have rebelled. Maybe if I hadn't forced them to go to church. You have to give them their freedom. Maybe I, maybe I was too controlling. And, of course, the rebel kid says, yeah, yeah, that was it. It's all your fault. If you hadn't made me go, I would have made my own decision. And I've been godly. No. I have seen many such individuals that have strayed away from, uh, from, the, from Christ. If they were ever saved in the first place, they had rebelled. I've seen far more, I think, who were raised in godly Christian homes turn out uh, to live for Christ themselves more than not. But a child's deliberate choice of rebellion and disobedience can sidetrack the best of training. So, if it isn't a guarantee, what is it? Well, let's go to the next perception of this. Some take this to mean that if, in Proverbs 22, 6, that if you train them up in the way he should go, in the way that he as an individual should go. So, if, for instance, it would be like if this, if this kid early on demonstrates a propensity for understanding math. Really good at math. So because he has a unique ability in the area of math, you're going to get him specialized training in math because that's unique to him. So the idea with this verse is train up a child in the way this particular child should go because he has these great abilities and talents. For instance, maybe he's got art he or she's got artistic ability or musical ability that's maybe unique. And so you channel that person with their particular talents. You're giving them individual unique training in accordance with the way they should go. Um, I don't know what you think about that. Um, this, that perspective is more of a modern imposition on the scripture. In other words, it's the idea that um, it's kind of like the idea of gifted and talented programs in the public schools. Do they, do they have them around here, gifted and talented? Where people, you know, they're borderline genius kids, and so they pull them out from the hoi polloi and put them in a special class. You know, you don't want them among the, the commoners because they're not going to expand. So they've got this special math ability or special art ability, and so you, you're getting the, they're in the gifted and talented class. We had those in the Detroit area. And this is kind of the, it's, that's kind of the modern concept. This kid has a talent or an interest in a, certain, in a certain direction, and so we're going to encourage it. That's not what this means. That is a modern idea that's being, been imposed. Now, it is a regular, I mean, some, a few of the commentators will say that. 
Not many, thankfully. That is a modern concept imposed on the narrative. The third one is this, the third perception, or interpretation, if you, you rather. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. The idea is that if you train him in accordance with his natural, selfish will, he's not going to depart from that. You don't have to agree with it. I, just, I, I do want you to understand. Do you understand the differences between all of these now as we're progressing through them? Train up a child in the way he would go. Dr. J. Adams said, train him up in the way he will go, but he will not forsake the path of his own making. When he is old, he will not depart from this. If you train him in accordance with his natural selfish desires, he will not depart from this. The concept would be like, I don't know if you've ever had a, uh, planted a sapling. Anybody ever done that? You planted a tree? Have you ever had a sapling that seemed to be growing crooked? What did you do? Well, you, maybe you got a straight stick and you put it, and then you tied it, stake it down, and got ropes here and there. Why? Well, because early on, you see the way this tree is naturally bending. It's naturally going a certain way. So the idea there is to straighten it out early so that when it grows up, it grows up straight and tall. But if you were to leave it in the way that it would naturally go, would it naturally straighten itself out? No. So that's, that is the idea with, this, with that look at this passage of Scripture. Train up a child in the way that child naturally wants to go. And when that child is older, they're not going to depart from it. They're going to be bent and twisted like a tree that was never, uh, never staked down. So uh, if you have a kid that seems to delight in torturing small animals, you might not want to, <laughs> you might want to take action. If you start noticing things, if you have a child that seems to think that you exist to fulfill his or her wants, you might want to impart a reality check to that child. To let a child pursue their natural propensities, which may not be good, is almost a guarantee that they will continue in that. Now, is there, is there other passage, are there other passages of Scripture? Look in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29. Chapter 29, and I want you to notice verse 15. Now, notice what it says there. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. That's the concept there. In other words, if this child isn't properly disciplined and dealt with when they're young, when they get older, they will bring, their, bring shame upon their mother. This is a similar concept of what, what the interpretive position on Proverbs 22.6 is. So, um, that's the concept, really, um, that's my point of view on this passage of Scripture. The other one is this. Here's the fourth one. That this is a general truth of a guaranteed righteous outcome. Some have argued that the book of Proverbs is a book of general truths conditioned by circumstances and choices. Um, they would argue that Proverbs 22.6 is a general truth about your child if properly trained by the parent will turn out right. And they would say that Proverbs in general are general truths. Now, is that true? Yes, I think it is. But does this passage of Scripture fall under the category? Because there are some things that Proverbs that are not conditioned, you know, like seven things the Lord hates, seven sins, you know, and he lists all those things. Are those conditional? I don't think so. So there are some things that may fall under that category and other things that are not. For instance, Proverbs 22.4 says, um, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Is that generally true? Yes. But what, what if 
God's will for you in any season of life is for you to be impoverished. For instance, um, did Paul not have the humility and the fear of the Lord when uh, he didn't have a cloak to clothe himself in jail and he had to write and ask that the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus when you come bring with you in the books, especially the parchments. Or when he said, I know how both to be uh, be abased and how to abound, to be full and to be hungry. Well, what are you to conclude? Well, was not Paul walking in the humility and fear of the Lord? Otherwise, he would have been prosperous all the time. Well, I think that this is an example of that, that there are circumstances within the will of God where God wants us to suffer need. But does that, is that how Proverbs 22, 6, is that our perspective of that? Suffice to say, I don't think this passage of Scripture is a guarantee of an outcome. It's not, if you follow the formula and mix all the ingredients just right, you're going to have this wonderful outcome. And in part, I believe that because I've seen, um, I've seen in the Scripture itself. I see one parent who had two of his children go really wrong, go really bad, making a horribly bad decision that caused absolute chaos, not only for them, but for many, many other people. And their names were Adam and Eve. And they had a kid, had a, had a couple kids. One was named Abel, and then they raised Cain. And Cain was a murderer. First murderer. So, and the one who dealt with Cain, remember the story, right? Bring an offering. Abel brought an offering. It was accepted. Cain brought one. It wasn't accepted. Abel brought of the flock of his field, and it was a blood sacrifice. At least that's inferred. And then, and then Cain brought of his produce and got mad about it when God didn't accept it. And God dealt personally with Cain and said, if you do the right thing, won't you be accepted? Why, are, why is your countenance fallen? Why art thou wroth? Why, are, why is your countenance fallen? And Cain, instead of getting his heart right, with God dealing with him personally, he hardened his heart and ended up murdering his brother. So, Cain did not follow the, the teaching of God himself. God speaking directly to him. So, who's the bad parent? If you're going to make that kind of inference that says that proper training guarantees outcome, and if it doesn't happen the way the, you know, the formula says, then the fault lay at the, at the feet of the parents, then does that apply to God himself? And I'm not, I'm not trying to be provocative here tonight. I'm just, I'm just asking us all to think about it. Personally, I've, I've seen many, many kids from godly Christian homes turn out uh, to live for Christ themselves. But I've seen also a child's deliberate choice of rebellion and disobedience can sidetrack the best of training. Now, what position shall we take? I think that it is saying that if you have a laissez-faire policy or attitude of letting things take their own course in child rearing without interfering, the result is going to be guaranteed disaster. That's what I think the passage is saying. That if you don't take steps to straighten the tree early, that tree is going to be bent and crooked and twisted. That's the idea I think he's talking about here. I struggled with this. Uh, for about 10 years, I guess, 10 years, first 10 years of my ministry, because I, I wrestled back and forth. And I'm not taking a position because experience doesn't bear it out, because I'm not, I don't think it really, I don't think it says that. My wife and I were first-generation Christians. We did not come from Christian homes. Some of you had the benefit of that. We did not. Um, my mother was saved uh, when I was young, but... My dad was not. We were not raised in a Christian home. Cindy was not. 
But we determined that we were going to try to raise our family correctly in accordance with biblical principles, and there wasn't a whole lot available. There are books and books written by decent people today. There wasn't back then. So we were just kind of, okay, what's the Bible say about this, and how do we deal with this kid? And, and uh, you know, there wasn't much written for Christian parents. So they, had to, they did have Dr. Spock, not Mr. Spock, Dr. Spock, okay? There's a difference. But we just did basically the best we knew. Did we make mistakes? Yes. Were there things that maybe I wished I had known then that I know now? Yes, absolutely. Yet when our kids became teenagers, we had this conversation multiple times, one in particular, although most of them were teenagers. We were sitting around the table, and I told them, we are not perfect parents. That's a given. But we did the best we knew. And if you reject it, and mess your lives up. They were a little wide-eyed here at this point with me. If you reject it and mess your lives up, we are not going to spend the rest of our lives feeling guilty because you became a rebel against God. You're not going to blame us. It's on you. Now. Now, beloved, that's a little easier said than done. I think probably most parents look back and they have twinges. Eh, I wish I hadn't done that that way. But I would just suggest to you that if you tried to keep the tree straightened, if you made a conscious effort in that direction, any Christian parents, that, that's what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to, you're trying to straighten the tree so it grows, grows up straight and tall. And maybe you didn't do everything that you could have done, but you did your best. Then the responsibility lay directly in their lap about what they did. And I would encourage you as parents, don't spend the rest of your life feeling guilty about the rejection of a, a child that has spurned what right they had. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we uh, pray that, that you would take your word this evening and make the application. I pray, Father, that you would help each one of us as parents and grandparents to do the very best we know. I pray for each young person that they would take the truth that they've been given, albeit maybe by imperfect hands and imperfect people, that they would take the truth that they've been given and act responsibly on it, knowing that they are accountable to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay.